Hare Krishna, Kamal Lochantru. Welcome to the Monks Podcast. Uh, it's been a long cherished desire for me to have you and finally it's worked out. I remember among our first discussions we had in Mira Road Temple, you told me your, how you were introduced to Krishna consciousness and your journey. It is quite inspiring and since then I have been observing how under your stewardship the Mira Road Temple has progressed in almost, you could say, all dimensions of Krishna consciousness. We have had many, many wonderful temples growing, but along with the temple, you had vigorous youth activities, you had vigorous uh, children's activities. I think in, in children's activities, education, dimension for children, I think your uh, the temple is a pioneer. And of course, personally, I've seen how deeply absorbed you are in Shastra. And I always uh, appreciate your insightful and candid as a candid explanation of scriptures so and uh, bhakti shastri bhakti vaibhav even the sandarbhas which you are teaching so it's you have managed, the prabhupada said that we need Bra brahmanas with a kshatriya spirit so we need to be teachers as well as managers so in many ways i've seen that you have been able to embody that blend in a very effective way so thank you very much for joining today and i thought that we could discuss broadly on the topic of how our movement has evolved over the last four or five decades since Prabhupada started it in, or, restart, uh, or established in India and especially in the two, three decades that we have been actively involved in the movement. So maybe you could start with briefly your story and how you came to the services that you are doing currently. That will give you some personal context to the discussion. Yes, actually... I'm very happy that you uh, asked me to join the show. Uh, I adore you as one of the intellectuals in our society, which is uh, dedicated only to the intellectual world, and, uh, giving a, a nourishment to the intelligence of uh, our intelligence of the moment. Because uh, if the intelligence is nourished and the soul is nourished, because intelligence, Papa says, is the uh, next door neighbor of the soul. Yes, and, uh, exactly. our movement actually requires uh, some intellectual input. Otherwise, many intelligent of our society uh, have left the movement. And uh, many intelligent people, actually, they feel uh, undernourished after a few years in Krishna consciousness. Uh, they're doing a very wonderful job, uh, service to the movement, to Srila Prabhupada. So it may not be really appreciated in a mass level. Uh, definitely the class will appreciate. In the Bhagavatam, when uh, Narada was speaking to Vyasa, that you write a book which is so pure that uh, it should be uh, in such a way that uh, bhakti should be described in every page, in every uh, verse, in every word. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha uh, should not be there even a tinge in it. Then Vyasa, he told Narada, who is going to read this thing? Then Narada says, don't worry, there are some people who are going to read this Bhagavatam. And uh, they, by experiencing this Bhagavatam, they'll experience so much of bliss that as others will automatically follow. The class are always very few, you can count in numbers. Uh, but their experience and their realization, their thoughts, are going to be the assets of the future of this uh, movement. And I find that uh, you and your endeavors and your writings and your uh, this, this podcast, uh, the first time I'm hearing this word podcast, uh, <laughs> is going to be an asset for the movement for the future to come. It's what I feel. Going back to your question of uh, how I came in touch with the uh, Krishna consciousness. Uh, I'm just sorry, uh, if I may respond, and you're very kind and encouraging. But, uh, what you said is, actually echoes uh, my thoughts and experiences, not in that sense that I am doing a lot of intellectual service, but it is true that uh, the intellect, those who are intellectually oriented, often they don't get much nourishment. And then they go away, as you rightly said. And we can say that materialistic people are, people are just materialistic. But even among people who are not practicing bhakti, there are some people who are sattvaguni, at least in terms of their intellectual analysis. And yes. we, need, we need to be able to reach out to them. So basically, yes. the podcast format 
has become quite popular in the west slowly it's coming to india so originally it was meant to be audio but the yeah. podcast format is that two people just sit together generally speaking and have a candid detailed discussion and somehow yes. what has happened is in this format has ca- caught uh, has caught uh, attention among people because it is not scripted because normally when yes. the, in the media the interview is there then there are very fixed questions and answers so everybody knows it's largely scripted and yeah. this is long form it goes generally a media interview will be 5 10 minutes but this can go mm. for a long time and uh, one of the in, in those who do podcast expertly one of them say that even the secular world there they say that nobody can actually wear a mask for a 2 hour discussion you know 5 minutes 10 <laughs> minutes 15 minutes you can put on a mask <laughs> so in that sense uh, the the philosophical and the human both mm. come out in these podcasts and uh, basically i started this when the pand- pandemic started because when i was traveling mm. across the world i used to give classes but in various parts of the world i was also getting the association of devotees senior devotees uh. with whom i would talk so i thought i'm giving classes virtually let me try to get the association of devotees also virtually so that's how i st- that one of the ways i started the podcast so nice thank one. you for your uh, appreciation and a very i would say precise appreciation not that i am doing it but there is a need and i am i can play some small part in it so please yeah, continue yeah. bro your answer so you asked about how how i came in touch with krishna consciousness uh yet give a small uh, brief about uh, i have been born as a madhu brahmana so accepting krishna as god and doing some uh, celebrating some festivals and cater on krishna was not a new thing but uh, it was more religious uh, the religious side was more Uh, but the philosophical side was not very much uh, in our family uh, of course there are many scholars connected to this and relatives of us but they are not teaching and preaching the way uh, the uh, way i would have appreciated so it was in my college uh, when i was studying in marine engineering college in calcutta uh, it was dairam prabhu who he was the president of maya food and he had a college program so i just attended the program that is where uh, i felt that in the very first statement which he gave in the lecture uh, influenced me a lot very first statement not the entire lecture influenced me a lot that i at that time only decided that i should be connected with this movement and uh, somehow or other we uh, spread sanatan dharma and that that time itself i decided but i would not i did not decide to become a monk at that time but it took about a couple of months to decide I'll become a monk um so the very first line what is spoke uh, i still remember i quote practically every other lecture which i gave uh, that is we are all endeavoring to become happy this world for example happiness here we are trying to become happy and without we enduring miseries are coming <laughs> nobody wants to be happy miseries difficulties are coming without we not wanting it then he interestingly said another statement is if suppose everybody tries to become unhappy so then what happens miseries come uh, happiness comes uh, uh, without you wanting it hmm. as much as difficulties come miseries come without you don't wanting it uh, or you you not wanting it uh, in the same way um, happiness will come also without you not wanting it <laughs> it is very striking it struck me so so much so that uh, uh, i started reading prabhupad books uh, bhagavad gita i read uh, four to five days because engineering college in india it's like whether you attend class or don't attend class even if you attend you read something else it's crazy there so uh, it was interesting the five days i read the entire bhagavad gita and i understood nothing out of it you're talking about the con- concept of destiny and how that struck you so powerfully and then yeah, from- yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, that is a radical concept it almost goes completely against the ethos of the world so <laughs> bro this was a thing which was uh, uh, which struck me so much that i felt uh, and you're doing just a useless labor to become happy uh, because whatever uh, happens in our life especially happiness or misery experiences are predestined 
uh, I just contemplated at the time about all the events which happened in my life, whether it is very miserable events or good events or happy events. Um, most of them, especially one of the events which any young boy in India would feel proud of is to crack uh, IIT and get into some premier college. Uh, I still remember uh, that I was not at all qualified for this and still like what and in our college we had uh, before we not only you need to score good in your entrance exams, but also uh, you need to attend interview. And I attended the interview and I was not knowing about what this all marine engineering is all about, what is uh, about ship, shipping, etc. I, I thought in the interview I utterly failed. I could not even, they asked me a question, you're going to be in the ships. Uh, they showed me a model, ship model in Mumbai this happened. And uh, later on, I come to know the model of the ship is nothing other than the Jaladuta model. <laughs> Jaladuta ship which will probably went. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, they asked me, which is the front part of the ship, which is the back part of the ship. I was such a lay person that I could not even recognize what is the front part and what is the back part. So just imagine. And they took me, admit, they admitted me to this college. <laughs> so it is all karma. Okay. I remember in my 10th standard when my father was very upset about my studies, whether I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Uh, he took me to astrology. And I was not believing in astrology and all. I told him, oh, it's all fake. So at the time, I remember my astrologer told me that your son will have a job connected to water. He'll be traveling. Uh, then I, then uh, for him, ship and oil is far away. So he told he must be uh, getting a job in the irrigation department, irrigation, something to do with water, and he'll be a big officer, so he'll be traveling. <laughs> oh. I remember this statement. <laughs> so I thought there's something, some, something is there. It is not just uh, everything I do, something beyond uh, human uh, intelligence. So that's where I started uh, researching in Shri Prabhupada books. And uh, uh, one book which I got in touch with was Chaitanya Charitamrita or Ch teachings a lot. When I asked the devotee that you were talking about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, can I get some of his writings? Uh, what books he has written because I was not knowing Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, God and all. So he gave me, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wrote only eight verses but about him, Srila Prabhupada has written this book. Then I took that book and uh, after Bhagavad Gita, which I could not understand in a single words of it, uh, after sleeping in that Bhagavad Gita for, continuously for four or five days. It was teachings of Chaitanya, which was so sweet. I was captivated by it. Somehow, the many points went directly into my heart. I could understand. Till Prabhupada's writings is so, so beautiful in the whole entire Chaitanya uh, Charitamrita. People even think it's a complicated book, it's a very complex book, it's very difficult. But somehow I had more appreciation for teachings of Lord Chaitanya than Bhagavad Gita. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is the time I felt if, it, if at all there's any truth, it is, it is by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, and uh, I decided after reading teachings of Lord Chaitanya that I should propagate uh, these teachings you know, to extend whatever I can, whatever possible. So that is the time I decided to be a monk after reading Chaitanya, teaching Salat Chaitanya. Nobody told me uh, to join mm -hmm. and all these things. So this inspiration by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That's what, that is how I, I came in touch with Amazing. this movement and decided. <laughs> That's, what. That's amazing. So this was which year, for roughly? It was 1993. 1993. That is my third year and fourth year of my college. Started chanting. Uh, of course, at that time, there was a youth program in uh, uh, Calcutta. Uh, many devotees who were taking care. There was an Italian Goranga. Mm. And uh, uh, another Italian now at present is Count Epa, who used to be a teacher in Gurukul. I used to attend the association of him. There's Vidwan Goranga. <laughs> yes. Who, who was uh, uh, really a great Vidwan. And practically, I owe today whatever I am. And that I owe a lot to him, Vidwan Gorang, who so much of love and affection he 
uh, he showed him to me. He used to come all the way from temple just to meet me in our hostel. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. And I managed a lot. And at that time, uh, of course, a lot of energy was there. So I became a right hand of uh, uh, Aptik Prabhu at that time as a vice president. Uh, and practically, in Artyatra management, I was, I was so, so in, not, not totally involved into the entire thing. Of course, uh, three more uh, devotees joined in my in my from my college. It's Kavichandra Prabhu. He joined immediately after the uh, after uh, his college. Mahidhar Prabhu. He's he's uh, he joined Mira Road. And now Indranaj Prabhu. He is now the president of Amritsar Temple. So we four were uh, from that one batch. <laughs> Money Amazing. Okay. So 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 you were we. In your first second year, how many time, how many years were you in college before you decided to join? Two years. I came in touch when I was in third year, third and fourth year. This is the time when I. Oh, okay. So this was you said nineties roughly. Sorry, I missed that 90, date. Yeah, ninety three, ninety four. Okay, and then when did you come to when and how did you come to Mira Road and become the leader here? Oh, it's a story. Uh, uh, I was in only in touch with when I joined Merchant Navy. I was in touch with uh, uh, Vidwan Gorang Prabhu, yeah, uh, and uh, uh, Italian Gorang. At that time, uh, I was only in touch with them on with letters and all. At that time, there was no email, phone, and all. I used to send a lot of donations to them, and uh, it so happened that uh, I came in touch with uh, His Grace Atma Tattva Prabhu through his lectures. Yes. series of lectures uh, which was sent to me and i started hearing those lectures so on cassettes at the time i was very much impressed and i met him in in 96 i met him and i told him i want to dedicate my life i want to join your uh, uh, your your project of uh, uh, teaching and all these things so he told okay come after one year and then i am in udupi so i came left my job and then Uh, was about to go and join him, but uh, I heard that you now he has left and he has gone into some kind of seclusion. So I had to find a place where to stay. Then I contacted Madhu Prabhu, whom I knew very well. He was assisting uh, Devamrit Prabhu. Now he is Bhakti Rasan Maharaj. Now. Okay. Yes. I went to the temple and then I met um, Madhu Prabhu. Requested. See, I want to meet. Go to Atom Tattu. Then uh, can I stay for a few days? Then they told no, no, you cannot stay. Then Bhakti Rasal Maharaj told me that uh, uh, I am going to Bhakti Vinod Hospital because at that time it is going to be open. And he was the pioneer who actually made the entire hospital. Uh, he was one of the trustees there, and he was guiding how to preach to the doctors, mm. to the hospital, like that. So then. Um, uh, Mirror Temple is in front. You can you come there. I knew him just from because I was assisting in in his the 1996 centennial. He was conducting the All India uh, Debate Competition. I was part of the team which went to Madhya Pradesh and uh, Rajasthan. So in this way, I had some some connection with him, Madhav Prabhu and uh, Bhakti Rasan Maharaj. So then I, that is how I came to Mirror. I had not even known where Temple is. I just stayed there, and uh, fortunately, it so happened that my the one of my batchmen, he had joined this temple, <laughs> so I felt comfortable here. It was your friends, so this is the whole thing landed. Hmm. Uh, then after some time, I met 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 Maharaj. So let's go, Paul Maharaj, and told Maharaj, "See, uh, where I should go, you tell me." Then he told me, "Krishna sent you here, stay here." <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so nothing planned. Just uh, spontaneous. It happened. Stayed. That's all. Hmm. So, I I was introduced in ninety six and I joined in ninety eight, and um, so basically we can say that uh, we have seen our movement evolve quite a bit. Of course, we can say that the evolution has started a little earlier than what we joined. But I see. Recently, I was talking to one devotee. He used an interesting phrasing. He said, "We have Iskon 1.0, Iskon 2.0, and Iskon 3.0." So 1.0 is yeah. during Prabhupada's times, and Prabhupada mm. was leading directly. Then 
and then after prabhupad departed and when prabhupad's disciples were the prominent members and the prominent leaders of the movement that's is con 2.0 and now we are moving from 2.0 gradually to a 3.0 where more and more you know prabhupad's disciples are uh, retiring or leaving the world and more and more the responsibility for leadership is falling on the prabhupad grand disciples so we somewhere in between but apart from that generational change there has also been a demographic change in the sense that during prabhupad's times at least in the west almost every member of our movement meant is that they were full time member even if they grahasthas they were living in the temples mm -hmm. and in india if we consider there were two broad categories of members there were the western devotees most of the dedicated followers of prabhupada during prabhupada's time were western devotees and they were just they were full time members and there were life members who were who were in their own way culturally appreciative and dedicated to service but they were not dedicated sadhakas in the way is expected in this con or what we so in one sense we can say these two levels were there the full time devotees and the life members but over the years what has happened is that the life members they are still there we are cultivating but they are not a very prominent factor in iskons outreach or iskons demographic so we have the congregation which has become the most prominent part of the movement now almost in the west at least more than 95% of the devotees are congregation less than maybe 3 4% are brahmacharis and iskon in india it might be a little more maybe 5 to 10% but 90% has with is the congregation and uh, over a period and even i would say in india there was a phase where everybody was encouraged to become full time devotees like it was in prabhupada's times but more or less we also have outgrown that phase now that not everybody is going to become full time devotee and everybody is not going to become brahmachari even if they and even if they are going to become grahasta they are not likely to move into the temple and stay in the temple so they are going to have their families their careers and still be dedicated devotees so this this is a significant change in one sense we can say we are in uncharted territory because during prabhupad's times the life member cultivation was basically just uh, give them some give have some talks with them go to their house have have some prasad maybe give them books and give they get the contribution from them and full time devotees was like complete dedicated sadhana but how to cultivate congregation we don't have a direct uh, precedent for that in the history of our movement itself till now so how do, so i presume you must also have experienced this uh, transition and since you have been leading a community so maybe you can share your thoughts about how this transition you have observed it and what does it imply see we should know that our society's name is international society for krishna consciousness the moment you say society it means what it means from a child to a old man from a healthy person to a sick person somebody maybe somebody may be a retarded mentally retarded person to a very intelligent dynamic person in society all kinds of people are there so when you say international society the moment the word society has been used it refers that you will be having all kinds of people connected mm. to the moment so uh, so when you say society uh, it is going to take a turn or uh, into a society society is not just made up of few 15 20 people who stay in the temple just 15 20 people stay in the temple cannot be called a society like one tree in a in a land cannot be called a garden when you say garden you expect your trees your flower trees your mango trees your fruit trees your Your, 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 some some trees for beautification, all variety. That's called that makes a garden. So all varieties of people uh, participating in Krishna consciousness that is called a society. Uh, the very first day I joined, uh, then there was an announcement after a Sunday program that bhaktong ka prasad idhar hai. Then. Uh, uh, <laughs> Then I understood. I was thinking, what do you mean by that? 
भक्तों का प्रसाद इधर है ऑल आर भक्त ऑल आर डिवोट इज हियर एंड बाहर के लोगों का प्रसाद इधर सो इट वॉज वेरी डिफिकल्ट फॉर मी टू अंडरस्टैंड जिस टर्म भक्तों का प्रसाद मीन्स डिवोट इज प्रसाद इज हियर एंड आउटसाइड प्रसाद इज हियर so this is a very clear cut terminology that means anybody who is living in the temple is a devotee and anybody who is not living in the temple is outsider mm -hmm. but uh, anyhow i somehow i could i i, I just uh, lived with that after few months uh, then i saw those uh, who were called as outsiders uh, were the most hard working in our temple they were the people who were bringing money to our temple the whole janmashtami festival there are the people who part the money and uh, uh, they are they are day and night day and night were dreaming of having a big temple here and uh, those who were inside they were not so that kind of motivated except few of them <laughs> so it is a confusion how can you say bhakton ka prasad here bahar ka log kahi hai outside people here okay <laughs> It, it it was the situation was like that and it was natural everybody accepted that uh because that is the precedence before 90s mm -hmm. there are only two categories one is the insider and outsider um that's all but you cannot make a society divide the society like insider and outsider like that uh, society means varana and ashrama all kinds of people uh brahmachari is the grahastha is the vanaprastha is in sanyasis and when prabhupad has said it is a society there will be a natural growth going to happen towards that towards that varnashrama establishment as varnashrama of course how you define varnashrama there are many people are having different different ideologies about it but basically varnashrama means all categories of people who function according mm -hmm. to their and their 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 nature that is called varnashram isn't it so it is going to happen hmm? whether we want it or don't want it it is going to be happen it is going to happen how many uh, renunciates shri prabhu chaitanya mahaprabhu had in his, in his during his time tell me hardly no, 6 7 10 12 maximum can count on fingers isn't it so society uh, means varnashram uh, and in that only sanyasis will be very few uh, very few sanyasis will be you cannot force renunciation on anyone at least for a long period of time it is a natural outcome either of bhakti or a natural outcome of uh, his past karma uh, there is a vairagya yoga him so to artificially create a uh, uh, a A, a, a society of uh, renunciates is not a long term solution to our movement or any society rather so definitely the maximum number if you say comes to number it is going to be grahasthas definitely it is for mm -hmm. sure and it is a fact it is a natural course it is taking its natural course nobody has to uh, do anything extra for it like recently i was hearing to a sanya seminar a seminar given by pralhadananda maharaj to the sanya candidates and i am one of them mm. very interesting point right? because many seminars i attend only some few points which uh, strike your heart and said that to uh, for a baby to grow what you what you have to do uh, then everybody gave different ideas and uh, it all okay very fine but it all just keep the baby healthy it will grow <laughs> just the baby a little grow <laughs> growth is a, a nature of uh, of, uh, of consciousness where our consciousness that growth is there huh? so you just have to keep uh, the baby healthy and the baby grows into a child and youth and in this way grows tree also you just keep the tree or the plant healthy and it will grow the same way you keep your yatra healthy it will grow <laughs> so what is healthy healthy means healthy relationships So, if you have healthy relationship with the brahmacharis, the grahasthas, vanaprasthas, and sannyasis, you will find there will be growth, automatic growth in all four ashramas will grow, all the four varnas will grow, uh, and that is what is happening now. So, we don't have to be worried about anything. Some people say our movement is diluted because of uh, 
is congregation centered and all no i don't agree to that it is a natural outcome uh, just because somebody is not eating food in the temple and is earning his own food and eating doesn't mean that uh, uh, is something you are diluting the movement number 2 uh, you may find a devotee uh, congregation devotee coming to the temple once a week serving prasadam just for half an hour one hour uh, you may see him only for the one hour in the temple but for the next six days he may not be in the temple but his emotions are in the temple is thinking of going to the sunday program he may not be uh, uh, full time but you have to give value to that also that when he meets his friend he says you know i am a iskon ka hu i i go to iskon sundays mm. <laughs> so there is emotional value connected to that <laughs> you know so all this sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you davindra swarup prabhu makes a very nice point he says uh, how the whole concept of congregation development and congregation cultivation developed uh it uh, originated so he says that uh that originally the idea was people join the temple or they don't join the temple so yeah. in america when they would have indians coming sometimes devotees would preach quite forcefully you know should this material world is a place of distress and should just give it up and join the temple and indians who had gone from india to america they had basically gone for better prospects materially they had absolutely very few of them had the intention of uh, renouncing their world and fa- family and soon after a few meetings the devotees understood at least the devotees thought that these are not going to become serious devotees they are not serious people so they started neglecting them hmm? uh-huh. they started neglecting them they, and they found that week after week they were coming although the devotees would pay no attention because they thought they are not becoming devotees let's pay, pay a good time put some time on other people so uh-huh. he said that because they were coming so regularly uh-huh. if some person if some of their relatives if some person on the street had asked them do you which group do you belong to uh, or are you connected with any religious groups they said we are hari krishnas we are iskon devotees uh, but he said if, if somebody had asked us we would have uh, said they are not iskon devotees so basically we, you know, i had a podcast with uh, madhavan and prabhu from of the krishna katha amrit bindu so on this topic of who is a member of iskon ah uh, so it is it is it is almost like a extendable term we can't reduce it to one category so mm-hmm. as you what you're saying that just because somebody is have is a, a grahastha staying outside and having their own job and other things they can still be very dedicated devotees so yes, yes prabhu as you see a uh, one more point which i remember is uh, when we start a uh, this krishna conscious movement in initial stages it was only sankirtan i was hearing from his uh, is bhakti ragas by mara he was talking about the four levels of movements four movements within his khan krishna consciousness movement the first movement he said was sankirtan movement when like do what is go out for the distribution do hari naam sankirtan <clears throat> and in this way the sankirtan movement is and why we are doing sankirtan who are we distributing books what is the purpose the purpose is they read them and become devotees now gradually they become devotees seeing the hari naam sankirtan seeing the devotees very happy and very loving and uh, they seeing the um, uh, the books are reading the books they become devotees they start chanting hari krishna uh, they come to our programs they hear lectures now we say in the lectures chant 16 rounds follow four great rules so over a period of time four five years now they start uh, taking krishna consciousness seriously and uh, uh, they chant 16 rounds now for example if 100 people are doing that and their family and the children you cannot accommodate it in the temple now now they want initiation so now after sankirtan movement now you have initiation movement the second movement is the initiation so in the initiation movement uh, when the number of devotees increase naturally they would like to uh, in involve influential people and some funds also starts flowing they say that we want a temple because we want to be established in the in the in the society as a uh, as a recognized because and actually they bring some pride because when you go when krishna goes outside uh, he is chanting hari krishna and uh, he is his pandi devotee and uh, his boss asks him where is your temple naturally in india people will ask where is your temple then they feel there is a requirement of a temple so they all get together then start building a temple that's called temple construction movement 
So I have initiation movement and temple construction movement. First is Sankirtan movement, mm. and there is the uh, the initiation movement, and there is the temple construction movement. So once the temple is built, uh, everything is going on nice. I mean, more more and more people are coming, and these congregation or initiated devotees, even the brahmacharis, uh, now they are come to the age of forty, forty five, fifty. They have now they they feel that I need to immerse and grow myself in Bhagavatam. I want to do some in-depth study. I want to chant now more rounds. Uh, but the city life, and uh, even in the city also, the job which they have, the business which they are, it's not allowing them to do. So they want a simpler life, whether in the city or in a farm, wherever it may be. They want to get more time now. They want to become one of prastas. Uh, so there starts the Varnashrama movement. I still remember when I joined Iskand Mila Road in 1997. Uh, we made five, six brahmacharis were having teams, one, two, two brahmacharis, and we were going to collect for Janmashtami. I still remember 97, 19, 19, three, four, four, five years. We, we used to go shop to shop to collect money. Somebody used to give 11 rupees. Somebody used to give 51 rupees. Somebody 101 rupees. Uh, if somebody we used to, if somebody gives 500 rupees, that was a big thing. Uh, Mm. But uh, as the time went by, now uh, Janmashtami collection in 2002 or uh, 2003 in four five years, I had I did not go out and one of the brahmacharis went except two of them uh, that to just to meet uh, big donors. I just had a meeting with the congregation. Everybody took targets. Somebody fifty thousand, somebody one lakh like that. We could we could do the Janmashtami and save money for the. So just see uh, an evolution has happened. So as a brahmachari, I just had to be in the temple and motivate the congregation to go. But in the very uh, first few days, I myself had to go. And I remember as the day I joined, uh, after that, every day I used to go for Nagar Sankirtan with two brahmacharis, sometimes I alone, like that. Uh, so, and gradually brahmacharis came. Now, within the next five years, uh, the congregation were pressing me, Roji, when are we going for Nagar Sankirtan? <laughs> Fine. So we, we just see how the the uh, Sankirtan movement becomes initiation movement. And then by 2015, in Mira Road, the congregation collected money and then built a temple. Uh, they only collected the money. The ladies went door to door and built a temple. They wanted it. It is not that we are pushing, you know, we ha- I had to build a temple. Going to like, no, they wanted it. So they built a temple. Now, in after six, seven years, a uh, uh, group of senior devotees came to me, you're traveling so much, you know, we want to get Bhagavatam from my world. Why don't you do Bhakti Vaibhav, the Bhakti Vaibhav, Bhakti Shastri, we all do, but we want to do in-depth study, we want to learn slokas. Oh, this is all because of their 20 years of hard work for Krishna, which uh, made them uh, think that now oh, I want to engross myself in Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, mm. uh, I want to live a more simpler life. I want to do sadhana and all these things. So there is evolution, uh, and ultimately uh, it leads to Varnashrama movement. Somehow this Varnashrama movement uh, has been highly misunderstood as, as antagonistic to pure devotional service. Okay. Actually, yes, Varnashrama. Sorry, sorry, if I may interrupt you, just very, share a few thoughts about what you said about these four stages. Yeah. yeah. So what I, I had not thought about it in these in these terms, but what uh, had struck me is that. Like you mentioned about teach, like you not going out uh, to raise funds initially, and that other the other you don't have to go out directly. So it struck me that I have seen some devotees, with all due respects to them, they say that if you are not going out in the streets, what preaching are you doing? What is the use of what is the use of what you are doing? Now this is what we are meant to do. Well, it is it is what we are meant to do, but ultimately, okay, after we go out and do sankirtan. When people come to the temple, there are uh, there are so many other ways in which they need to be nourished also. So the temple has to be maintained, and then as you said, the the teaching education has to be done. So it we could we could get caught completely in one of these slots. It's not that sankirtan is not important. All of them are are we could say are important in their own place. But if we reduce our movement to only one, then it could become a problem. I had a talk with Vaisheshika Prabhu, very good podcast. 
so he is uh, he is so focused on book distribution and he is inspiring the world all over the world for book distribution but at the same time he has uh, a very systematic plan for cultivating devotees and in america one of the most uh, i would say flourishing communities is is the silicon valley community so we could say that uh, each of these stages has its importance but we can't fix it only on one stage like say if we focus only on temple construction and then we neglect harinam we neglect uh, cultivating devotees we neglect, we, then it could be a problem so if i understand right what you are saying is that in many ways as we are becoming a congregation based movement we have gone through the first three stages or or not we have gone a significant number of our devotees have gone through the first three stages there will always be devotees in the first three stages no doubt and they also need to be taken care of but we could say that more or less there is already something of a system in place to take care of them that uh, yeah. book distribution is going to happen harinam is going to happen we also have devotees who are going to raise funds and of course if people come they will be cultivated then they will get initiated so we cannot we cannot neglect these areas but at the same time we cannot let all our energy be spent only on these areas am i articulating it do you properly what if i understood what you said yeah you are you are you are you are perfect but just to add more thing to that in a 100 yeah. rupee note you have 75 rupees also 50 rupees also 25 rupees also so okay. just because we have reached the fourth stage of ashrama that doesn't mean others are neglected they are inclusive with in that uh, how i'll tell you <clears throat> uh, uh book distribution now uh when i i re- i just tell one one day of my experience of distribution one day what it was to me prabhu ji you go there i distributed 300 books in one sunday this sunday i am not i go to go to shirdi for book distribution why don't you go there lead the party so seven eight devotees we took a vehicle went all the way to virar station and then i expected last time if we could do 300 books in one day i would do uh, more because now uh, i am i'm somebody better <laughs> so i went since morning 8 o'clock till evening 5:30 6 o'clock two books went okay with all the team myself i was sure i mean i'm i fused totally fused then what i did i removed all the books which was on the table i was tired i sat on the table and i kept all the books aside the cartoons aside and i told her the word is now this day is gone let me do a small small gimmick now let me try pray to krishna i in mumbai as the local trains come in the evening lots of crowd go by whole day i've been watching them in uh, 6:30 7 o'clock just people are just going then i had a small mic then what i did was i sat on the table where the books supposed to be kept and mm-hmm. started giving a lecture on bhagavad gita and really okay few people started to attend and more few people by the time half an hour went by there were at least 3 to 400 people just around the entire thing just hearing to what i am speaking 3 400 Then, okay, people yes where was so, this I, exactly it was near our station near the near where we are uh, station when the part of that is that uh, railway crossing where all the people get down and go i sat on the table i was giving giving a, a class Oh, yeah okay. and after that half an hour i saw so many were there i thought let me hit the hammer now ha huh? i told mm-hmm. whatever i am speaking mai jo bhi bol raha hu idhar is sab ye kitab mein hai this is in this book you know 400 books went within half an hour so uh, somebody may say you did not do distributed books but i distributed books according to my nature what is my nature is to speak i am not a seller i cannot go Go to to different cell. So this is where Varnashrama comes into picture. Means you engage a devotee according to your nature. Somebody distributes books according to his nature. Somebody is like a a a, a good uh, <laughs> good marketing person. They can just say do this, do this. Oh, yeah, yoga, everything is there. Take this. Now he sells and takes the money. And somebody would just give a lecture and then uh, do a thing. And somebody would say, see, if you take this thing, this is good. Like Chhatriya, we can do. Uh, uh somebody does it different different ways 
so good distribution nagar sankirtan the core aspects are of our of our uh, philosophy uh, is not restricted doesn't stop because you are establishing or not rather the increase rather it will become more uh, effectively done because you are engaging people according to their nature mm that's amazing experience <laughs> you you really have a charismatic pull because at that place and uh, where people are so busy rushing around to get so many people to come but the point is well taken that you could do book distribution not just by talking one to one people but by but by giving a talk which inspires people yeah. amazing so now you give the example of 100 rupee includes other so what you are saying is if we engage devotees according to their nature then then all the other things will also happen so those who are inspired will do hari naam those who are in, those who are that that inclination that swabhava will do hari naam those will fundraising will done and then the in the cultivation for initiation will also happen yes okay so you were mentioning earlier that the idea of anashram is misunderstood i i interrupted you at that time you would like to elaborate that yeah uh the first point people think varnashram means uh go to the farm this there's a biggest uh, uh, some uh, false propaganda which has happened uh it is not that varna ashrama vibhagashah varna ashrama bhagashah it happens it happens because of one's nature uh krishna says mm-hmm. in the bhagavad gita guna karma vibhagashah guna guna is the main thing guna means the modes of nature so if you are able to engage a person according to one's modes of nature in krishna service that is our ashram like you have a brahmachari joining his farm he joins ashram for first one or two years because he is totally surrendered and sold out to his guru he would do anything you clean the toilet you do class right oh, very good but how many do you think would be like that and how long that person would be like that no he'll be happy when he is given seva or service according to his nature kayena vacha manasendriya vyatmanava prakrutir swabhava prakrutir swabhava so to identify person according to prakriti is his nature and engaging them that is actually varna you cannot force everybody to just to be a lifelong celibate if somebody is having the karma of being a lifelong celibate you cannot force him to get married <laughs> and uh, if somebody has a vaishya mentality you cannot say no you just be a brahmana be very humble and do good deeds you cannot do that um, because prakritir gyanavan api even though mm-hmm. one is a gyani the modes of nature are going to uh, force him to do a particular thing which nikram kim karishati how is it going to happen so bhagavad gita shri prabhupada preached around the world uh, that uh, principles we have to propagate and practice it and that can only happen when we are call our self as a society and society means varnashram there is there is no society without varnashrama that that is what is the thing and the misunderstanding is this thing uh, somehow when i speak of varnashrama many people say yeah. oh he is going to take us to some farm and he is going to make us uh, uh, plow the field <laughs> it is not that mm. uh, it is uh, many things uh, yeah you know what happens is so i said again to so echo your thoughts or reiterate there are there are like one of the challenges in communication is that uh terms don't always have objective meanings that, that there is a particular uh, term when i am using it i have a particular meaning in mind and when you you when somebody else you hears it or uses it they have another meaning in mind so yes. if we look at it from the perspective of uh, the bhagavad gita it's quite clear that varnashram means engagement as you said uh, according to swabhava and krishna says you cannot give up your swabhava in fact there are only two verses in the gita which krishna repeats twice you know one is manmana bhav and the other is shreyan swadharma viguna that you just cannot work not in cannot not work according to your nature mm. so this brings us to to again to elaborate on an earlier point you made that 
in the past purna purna chandra maharaj also makes this book point in his unspoken obstacles to devotional service that in the past we we thought that surrender means that rejecting our nature that our nature is just the body you are not the body so you are you are not your body body is nature also and you should just do what you are told to do but that is extremely difficult and then what happens is because of that many times see, there is uh no there is a, some there is a higher taste which comes by the practice of bhakti so which is uh, we could say higher spiritual taste higher bhakti taste we can say but now this is my terminology maybe there is some shastric terminology you might come to i feel that there is also some kind of a higher dharmic taste which comes when we act according to our dharma and so if a, if somebody is a painter they really get immense joy in painting somebody is 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 a musician or some whatever people have their particular interests attractions and they get some taste in that and what happens is for us to stay on the path of virtue we also need this taste because that higher bhakti taste takes a good amount of time to come we will need a significant amount of purification so to sustain us on that journey this higher dharmic taste is also required and we can say if we are deprived of that taste sometimes that leads to so much dissatisfaction so much distress that we can't even pursue the higher bhakti taste that because we are still we may say theoretically i am not the body and the soul but even krishna i am perceiving through my body mind machine only so if my body mind machine is totally disharmonious then it will be very difficult to pursue krishna also sure. so so that definition of surrender that reject your nature that is the side is the evidence of your surrender that has alienated i feel lot of devotees and it has made bhakti more difficult than it needs to be true um uh, hmm. see sarva dharman parityajya mamekam shanbaja ham tvam sarvapeepi mokshayishay mastaha it should be an outcome of your sadhana outcome of your realization Hmm. it cannot be enforced now when we say hmm. we are a society there are different kinds of people different natures if you don't recognize it then we are actually teaching mayavad philosophy mayavad means see everything as one no there is very gettedness there is a child who can be a far more devotee than a old man so but he will do devotion according to his nature sorry bro i am just amazed by this insight generally we think of mayavad as considering the spiritual reality to be like a amorphous oneness but we can say that even at the material reality if we equate it as a oneness that is also in one sense mayavad because we the True. essence of mayavad is not whether we are talking about the spiritual or the material it is that we are rejecting variety rejecting personality rejecting individuality that's an amazing insight yeah thank you yeah. i just wanted to appreciate that yeah mm. so in this way when you say society proper insists this word society international society it's a very important word in the entire uh, sentence or the phrase called international society mm. if a person is socially satisfied then he will be happily practicing krishna consciousness everybody wants a society like devotees they want a society of devotees and within that devotees all devotees are not the same nature or same mentality so if they proper said birds are the same feather flock together so and even this has been described that when bhakti samrit sindhu he said that uh, one has to associate with devotees but how what kind of devotees those who are prajati i mean those who have got same mentality and same uh nature so it is very important to recognize nature if you don't recognize nature then uh, how will you uh, make people very happy in krishna consciousness even till today for example if kamal lochan das is not given opportunity to teach krishna consciousness allowed to speak uh, he will not stay long in this moment it's a fact because it's my nature to speak and teach 
if a singer is not allowed to sing, uh, 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 then he will not stay in the moment for long. Most of the devotees whom we lost in the moment is just because they were not properly engaged. Hmm. So it's so this is a this is a very good point because sometimes when somebody leaves, we sometimes say that they, that person is just not sincere enough, not serious enough, they just fell into Maya. But to some extent, it is also we also need to take responsibility that maybe we didn't engage them properly. And that's how they left. That's why they left. Yes. Mm -mm -mm. That's true, bro. So, sorry. So you are talking broadly about Varanashram and engaging. The essence of Varanashram is engaging people according to their sabhava. Yeah. So, uh, so um. So to some extent, do you see this already happening in terms of, uh, in our movement of how we engage devotees? I can say that myself as a brahmachari, you know, uh, over the years, I, by Krishna's mercy, I have found space. Now, I can say that 20 years ago, if I had tried to do a podcast like this, he says, what are you doing? Wasting your time and wasting somebody else's time. Just go and do some, do something tangible. You know, go ahead and distribute some books or as you said, collect some, uh, collect some Lakshmi for Krishna. So in one sense that providing devotees space for their service, it has started happening to some extent. But uh, what are your thoughts about this? See, as I told in a few minutes back, it has to happen. Hmm. Because it is a society and it has to happen. It will happen. But how quickly it will happen is dependent on our leaders understanding the need of establishing Varnashram. A need of engaging people with the diverse mentality. Other leaders understand and create a healthy atmosphere. As I told, when you make the baby or keep a baby in a healthy atmosphere, the baby automatically grows. So mm -hmm. The whole purpose or the whole uh, endeavor of all our leaders should be to keep healthy atmosphere for people to exhibit their talent their, according to their nature. And then progress in Krishna consciousness. Every endeavor to protect Sanatana Dharma, propagate Sanatana Dharma, has to be appreciated, has to be supported. So that is why we require Kshatriyas in the movement. Hmm. Kshatriyas are those who are protectors. And they say, okay, you want to do this? Okay, this is the field, you do it. So what is happening is when you talk about an idea uh, of uh, this is how we can propagate dharma. So that idea is coming according to his nature. And that idea has to be supported, has to be encouraged. Uh, Prabhupada said different loads for different folks. Hmm. And for uh, what is the different, different lore? Lore for different folk. Lore, lore means there are like different kinds of folk. Uh, you have uh, different, you present, add, different presentation, yeah, different okay, different kind of presentation. Okay, different kind of ways. Uh, you 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 present uh, Krishna consciousness to them, and uh, every idea to protect Sanatana Dharma, every endeavor to protect Sanatana Dharma, to connect people to Krishna, has to be supported, has to be uh, uh, appreciated. Uh, we should never criticize and uh, try to subdue somebody's efforts to uh, propagate Krishna consciousness because he is doing his efforts, he is putting his efforts and his ideas are according to his nature. And if somebody is uh, willing to support and uh, or uh, supporting and propagating and uh, protecting Sanatana Dharma, it has to be supported. It has to be encouraged. I was just deliberating on this point that what you mentioned earlier that if we don't do this, we will actually uh, drive devotees away. So it is. So now, uh, two things come in mind: that uh, how do we help people understand their nature? Hmm? And to some extent, I have encountered devotees uh, who were who had kids who I mean devotees who were children who grew up in gurukuls, and they were told. I, I know two devotees actually, they were told that you are a Brahmana and all day they were meant to uh, you are a Brahm memorize verses. 
and these kids said that this was like the most miserable time of our life and they said that we basically i can say that i have vaishya mentality i like to do things and i like to um, earn and i like to share so there is this possibility of um, misdiagnosing also so uh, so my, my thoughts i'll share basically instead of in, in, in understanding nature maybe it is not today as important to like class classify people into these four categories as to basically find how best they can serve so the principle is not just the categorization but the compatible engagement and within the within the ambit of services that are there in the movement within their interests where we can find their uh, where we can find an engagement for them that would be a contemporary application of varan ashram does that make sense to you ah yes uh definitely but as the movement grows the society grows then uh, we have to categorize okay uh, now for example you have uh, a brahmana how do you categorize a very important question how do you categorize uh, here uh, it is my own uh, perception it can be uh, debated upon there are three number 1 is birth number 2 is uh, his birth chart which rashi all rashis are there the rashis also have a brahmana kshatriya vaishya and shudra number 3 is interest all the three has to be taken in consideration if these three things are not taken into consideration if you just see only the interest then uh, if you don't see his rashi nature so as i told for now as you mentioned contemporary thing what is seen is only nature and interest but as we evolve as a society when we uh, then we have to see uh, his birth chart and then see the rashi in which is of course astrology comes into picture there and i now find uh, our movement is now uh, progressing in the direction where many uh, devotee astrologers very good devotee astrologers are really giving good advice and uh, um uh, i find uh, some devotees my center some devotees talk this they were very really happy many families which were about to be uh, broken up uh, because of some guidance they they they, they were they became okay uh, so this that is how this this comes plays a role and as we go further uh, when we refine the ashrama when we rectify the ashramas brahmachari grahar savana prastha the next generations i mean the next to next maybe out of three or four generations then you because the garbhadana sanskaras then you have a refined way of trying to find out the birth uh, acquired birth also comes into criteria of deciding one's varana ashrama which is not going to happen today you cannot just say okay he's born in this family it doesn't happen it will take time because uh, our birth many in the western countries or even in india also uh garbhadana sanskar has not been done and a mm-hmm. lot of mix varanas have come so like even when you or t- in western countries they are interested in in uh, keeping a dog in their house so when they buy a dog they see the pedigree isn't it <laughs> they, they see the pedigree <laughs> yeah. so when you want to get a dog in your house you see the pedigree why not you see the pedigree of a girl who is going to come to your house <laughs> okay it's a uh, it's a different uh, discussion altogether uh, it takes time so sanskars now many grahasthas in our movement uh, they are taking guidance from uh, very uh, experienced grahasthas who are advising them how to do the garbhadan sanskar and over a period of time when you work on it it is going to happen see as we are developing a healthy society healthy society grows into a more mature society it is going to happen today or tomorrow day after tomorrow it's going to happen so all the three considerations i am mm-hmm. speaking these three points uh in deciding a nature uh, after uh, uh speaking to many people in sri sampradaya and madhav sampradaya uh, who are uh, very very much fixed up in their philosophy of vaishnavism and also they are uh, very accomplished astrologers uh, hearing to them speaking to them Uh, my conclusion is all the three the interest and the birth 
chart means three the birth itself uh, uh, and okay. interest is what being seen now like you say contemporary but we cannot be just uh, uh, be happy with that particular thing and say that's all no we have to develop into seeing the the astrological aspects you know what rashi belongs to there may be a brahmana by like birth also by nature also but his chart shows the rashi shudra rashi so he is more interested in singing than chanting shlokas because singing is actually uh, more shudra -like. so in varnashrama we have to designate shudra as lowest highest brahmana as highest it is not like that it is nature in no nature is higher no nature is lower this is where we uh, do the first mistake that shudra is lower brahmana is higher there is no lower and higher it is nature <laughs> according to one's nature one acts uh, one one does uh, so this is what is the just to meet bro this is a very striking point i mean you know there are so many points you have made i feel this this itself could be an entirely different podcast on its own about how to determine uh, how to determine varana in today's world mm, and uh, maybe we can have a podcast on that in future but right now just this point that often when the varnas are presented as hierarchical then they become mm, are presented so you can say only as hierarchical then they become on one side there is always a possibility that some people will exploit the others but even if there is no exploitation there is a visceral negative reaction because you know this it seems discriminatory so 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 what you are saying is from the individual's perspective say for example if somebody is a vaishya that vaishya will not will not actually feel that the brahmanical duty is better for that person yeah. that is the best so when we are saying that uh, from the hierarchical perspective in one sense it it is true that okay somebody is more inclined for when brahmanical person may be more inclined for spiritual knowledge and spirituality but in terms of the worldly from the world's perspective this is more of uh, more of compatibility than hierarchy in that sense you are saying that it there is not higher or lower am i understanding right yes that is from one's perspective also even from the spiritual perspective also if you see there may be a brahmana who is very scholarly there may be a shudra who is not so scholarly but the shudra may have more attachment for krishna then the brahmana who is a scholar so one's spiritual uh, interest is also not dependent on one var varna and ashrama there may be a sanyasi who is a perfect vairagi following perfect dharma of sanyas but there is a small kid who has more attachment for krishna than that sanyasi so in this way varna and ashrama cannot decide the criteria of one's advancement in devotional service so just because somebody is a brahmana and more scholarly and somebody is interested in worshiping the deity ultimately what matters is attachment for krishna that is the measurement of one's vaishnavism or one vaishnavata uh, so this is how we should see that just because somebody is a brahmana somebody is a vaishya some brahmana may be thinking of uh, uh, how much dakshina i will get by doing this yagya or puja uh, though he is a devotee and all there may be a vaishya who is thinking of how to run the govinda so that temple will be built <laughs> <laughs> yeah i appreciate how you bring uh, such vivid contrasts that drive home the point so emphatically so both are thinking of money but one is doing it according to their varana and one is actually not in one sense the the brahmana thinking about dakshina is uh, is actually going according uh, not so much according to their swabhav and that they will be doing a disservice a little bit over there more than a little bit so 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 actually the earlier point also which you mentioned in the prahlad bhagavatam is quite clear about this you know, like verse like viprad vishad guna ita darvind nabha that a brahmana who is turned away from krishna cannot deliver himself whereas even a, a swapacha who is devoted to krishna can deliver the entire dynasty so so then the purpose of varanashram if we if we think of this 
it is not so much to create a hierarchy as to provide engagement to people yes yes 100% but then there is there does seem to be an implicit sense of hierarchy because brahmanas are highly respected kshatriyas they are highly respected in fact we also have kshatriyas kshatriyas the world will respect somebody who has political power but those who have political power respect the brahmanas and we can clearly see that there is a hierarchy in the level of respect offered to people so doesn't that signify that Brahman, the brahman varna is considered higher and other varna is considered lower i'll give you a small example for this when nawab husain shah came to meet sanatan goswami so now uh, sanatan goswami stood up welcomed him and gave him a higher seat in front of sanatan goswami nawab husain shah is nobody there in the purport shil purpose says sanatan goswami saw nawab husain shah because is the king is a representative of krishna and he is yadya uh, dibhuti matsattam shrimad uttam eva he quotes the verse and says wherever you find some energy and splendor you should see as a energy of krishna so these varna and ashramas especially varnas when you are talking about varnas what the brahmanical energy is flowing through a particular conditioned soul a kshatra energy is flowing through a particular conditioned soul a shudra is also has some energy flowing through a conditioned soul it's all krishna's energy is flowing through these different souls so in this way uh, there is no question of any difference in hierarchy even in the respect i come from a village <clears throat> definitely belonging to a brahman family everybody respects in telugu language we say in respectfully garu garu means you are a uh, respectful person hmm? so somebody belong to a vaishnava vaishya community my grandfather will always respect respect them as garu means respectfully uh, even shudras hmm, they were also respected everybody had mutual respect among each other i have seen it with my eyes in my childhood i still remember in our house of course now it's all gone all the properties and everything is gone there are 20 families residing in our house in our in our farm in our village house for five six generations they have been with our family working in the fields but everybody were happy and we would be respected this mutual respect even what to speak of anything even the recent past you must have heard they would call driver saab ko bulao i'm just telling remnants of the varnashrama driver saab saab means you know is mm. a officer yeah <laughs> driver saab ko bulao isn't it So uh, if we say a driver is looked at, hey driver, call out. No, driver stop. It is a usage in even in in India in many places. So uh, it is not that uh, uh, there was only respect unidirectionally flowing up. There was a mutual respect, mutual love and respect. Uh, once there was a one lady who used to sell uh, vegetables to her in her house. My grandmother used to bargain. and one day she became very upset this vegetable lady because my grandmother was very much good in bargaining we used to give rice she gives vegetables that's the barter system as a child i observed once she became so upset and then she said she is a shudra lady from from in village then uh, she just left uh, leaving her fruits i don't want you take your fruits you get your chawal i am going then my grandmother ran behind her told See, you know, I, I, I'll be, I, I'll get the sin of making you cry. Please come. <laughs> I'll get the sin. So people are afraid of uh, sinning. Uh, if they disrespected somebody, they made somebody cry. So it is very subtle. This, this uh, culture is very subtle. Uh, externally, you may find a brahmana going, a sutra is playing obeisances, uh, and uh, but actually, in the mind, the brahmana plays obeisances. Uh, he feels how can i run the uh, temple without uh, or run the fields without that person uh, cleaning and working in my in the garden so there is a mutual respect uh, it is not what is been presented 
uh, by the British. Uh, Varnashrama as being presented by the British. That is the problem. Hmm. So, you know, there are so many points which are coming in and I'm wondering which direction to take this now. So the, the thing is that I also noticed this when I used to go to villages. The culture of respect was there. Now there might be a hi- yes. the hierarchy was the hierarchy might be there that like the somebody like even somebody like the boss and a servant, but that does not mean the boss would disrespect or exploit the servant. The boss would also take care of the servant. Yeah. And to some extent, yes, yes. to some extent, we could say that this this notion that any kind of social stratification is uh, is meant for discrimination exploitation that is that is like that is a very leftist view of the world that is yeah. left always is against hierarchy and even in the west uh, there was there were hierarchies which were exploitative and there were many hierarchies which were not exploitative also mm-hmm. so the idea is that so so this way of looking at the world has become quite mainstream uh, in terms of society that's why varnash like i was talking with devotees some devotees in the west and they said that one of their concerns with varanashram is that it can be very easily equated with the caste system and in the west the caste system is considered to be such a great social evil from india that if we as a movement start saying that we if if people misunderstand or misrepresent what we are saying and they say that iskon wants to establish a caste system all over the world uh, that could devastate our outreach our reputation our public perception so but what you are saying is that uh, that this the caste system as is there may, might have been some there was some discrimination also but the purpose of an ashram is not to create a hierarchy where one will be one will be disrespected by the other or exploited by the other it is basically to everybody is respected for the contribution that they are making true hmm there is a difference between varna and jati yeah this is generally we don't jati use the word jati much system. yeah we don't use the word jati much in our movement and that's why we equate varna with jati sometimes yeah jati is different hmm and varna is different we are talking about varna ashrama we are not talking about jati vad jati vad is different hmm that's so why when you are varna and jati vad is the work of the british what they who made the uh, caste census it was done by the british so that they can fight among each other so even still it is continuing it's a big uh, uh, game plan by the british who created the leftist in the, this thing in, in our country in this country of india the british they paid the indologists they paid uh, the translators to depict this uh, country as a poor country as a country where uh social evils are prevalent even till today when you when you go to some places like india it is like that <laughs> so think they think everybody is on the street everybody is just a kid who is just crying and and then has got some dripping nose and has no food to eat <laughs> hmm. i never saw any <laughs> like that <laughs> that's that's so true so we can say that we as a movement uh first of all for our own devotees we need to engage them and then we could say this could also apply to the broader community broader world also you know in the west uh, in the i was on temple so they use two words they use the word congregation and the community and the use of word congregation is more or less committed grahastha devotees and community is the broader broader society who is uh, who is of interest to us and who has some interest in us they may they may be our well wishers they are basically favorable so yeah. so we could we could say that this principle of compatible engagement is something at least with respect to devotees doing sevas in the temple we need to start with that yes yes mm-hmm. so do you see this in one sense i, I had asked this question already and you said we, without doing this we cannot we will not be able to sustain our movement so there are two things now one is from the institutional leadership perspective that they need to provide devotees the space 
and that is sometimes difficult because the leaders also have a lot of pressure from their leaders to achieve certain goals to achieve certain targets and even if they want to you know they they also need manpower or, or you could say devotee power human power human resources to meet those goals so one is the one is the, the perspective from the leaders so any thoughts on this that what we how can we go about or how do we deal with this challenge See, Srila Prabhupada always said that uh, uh, in, I was attending one of the GBC college seminars that one should not, a leader should not kill the enthusiasm, the spirit to serve Krishna. They should be yes. the fire should always be born. So that is the leader's job. And for that, uh, he has to, the leader has to uh, do whatever it requires to be done. If he cannot, he hand over the person to another leader who can do that. Uh, we, it, our, our service as a leader is to engage people in Krishna service, and we cannot we cannot engage some people. Then that hand over the person to somebody else that can be engaged. Uh, so projects are built not by manpower or money power. Projects are built by enthusiastic participation of devotees. I know a person who has a lot of money who wants to build a temple. Uh, you tell where I can, I told, where are the devotees who, have, who has the enthusiasm to build a temple? Even if you have about 50 families who feel that enthusiasm, you want to build a temple, all your money is worthwhile. Otherwise, there are so many temples in India. Uh, even in Rindavan, there are so many temples, not even a single kaka goes there. Uh, so, so, yeah, as a temple, beautiful temples, hardly anybody goes there. So now, uh, projects are built not because of you have fifty people. Out of fifty people, how many are enthusiastic? Hmm? Four people are enough. If they are enthusiastic, you can have projects. So uh, don't. Uh, rely on numbers, rely on the enthusiasm, uh, happily enthusiastic and happily participating devotees. That's the uh, main thing. Uh, projects will happen. I, I, there was one devotee many years back who came uh, to join a temple because he was impressed by my lecture. But he was very intellectual and he was, he was, he was scientific thing oriented. And I sent him to BI. He told, I cannot engage you. Uh, if you are having some Sanskrit kind of thing, uh, orientation thing, then I can engage you in, uh, in Shastric studies and all these things. But uh, you have a BI kind of mentality, you go there. So this has to be learned by our leaders. This is called mature leadership. If somebody is not really, uh, you're not able to groom and uh, be happy in your, in your, in your ideology, in your this thing, then ask him to go somewhere else and then happily engage. This is called... Uh, Leadership, uh, a collective leadership. Uh, it is not my project, your project. It is Shri Prabhupada's project. All projects are Shri Prabhupada's projects. In this way, uh, we should encourage. Uh, if we had a uh, good network among leadership, to many more, lot of uh, Brahmachari manpower, at least I would say, would have been retained a lot. Been retained a lot. Because of lack of network among leadership, what happens? One leader has a particular vision. If somebody doesn't fit into that, then uh, he is considered that he's useless. No, he's not. There may be some project. Maybe maybe you more useful there. Uh, he may be more happy, enthusiastic there. You should encourage. Okay, why don't you go and serve that? Nice deal. Be happy. Of course, it is happening now because uh, leaders are more connected these days, especially in India. Earlier, it was not. And they were they were come. Compartmentalized. Now uh, there is a firm where uh, people discuss opportunities of uh, going from one place to the place, joining some projects. Individual projects have been uh, encouraged. Even certain projects which are uh, which cannot be put within the organizational framework, respond uh, that also been encouraged. So in this way, as I told, as a society, we are maturing. We don't have to be. Uh, worried about uh, we are diluting, we are maturing. That's what I would like to say. 
Beautiful. Uh, so for a first point is that, that it's like, uh, if I can't engage you, that doesn't mean that you are devotionally useless. Yeah. Yes, my project, it's not possible for me to engage, but there will be other projects which can be found out. And maybe as you said, if there's networking, then you can, uh, then we can ourselves connect somebody with some, connect a devotee with somebody else. Yeah. I think that, that also requires a non-possessive mentality in one sense. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it is again with the numbers game that, oh, you know, I made this person a devotee and then if this person is going away somewhere else, then <laughs> that person will not come in my track record of how many people I brought to for initiation or I made into devotees or whatever. So... <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave an example many years back when somebody told, oh, yeah, I made him a devotee, you know, he's leaving and going there uh, to another group. And then I told it is like a cook saying, I made the cook, I made all the dishes, I have to eat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you, it is for distribution. It is for, so everybody enjoys it. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like that. <laughs> okay, so that's true. And of course, I would say that possessive is not always bad also. It can be, but in one sense, the possessive mentality, what might seem as a possessive mentality could also be a protective mentality. That maybe, you know, this devotee goes over there, who will take care of that devotee or whatever. But if there is good networking, then it is definitely possible. Definitely uh, when a daughter is being given uh, to a other family in marriage, uh, in the vivaha, uh, definitely the uh, father of the daughter sees now whether that person is capable of taking care of the daughter, my daughter or not. So that has to be done. <laughs> hmm. uh, oh, that's a beautiful example. <laughs> Again, I I have appreciated how vivid, ex- vivid and uh, potent examples you give. So uh, to some extent, uh, I would say that uh, this also is happening. But it's not so happening so organically. So that so naturally, but it's like if somebody would have some specific talent, then it's relatively easier. Okay, you know, you have this talent, you 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 get training from this person. And then that uh, that works out quite well. So that last part you said we are maturing, not diluting. And that's a beautiful point. So engaging people according to nature. It is not diluting the principle that the that there should be obedience and adherence. Rather, it is recognizing that the important point is not obedience, uh, but the important point is actually helping people grow and engaging them in such a way that they will they can flourish in bhakti. Mm-hmm. That's so so good. Overall, what I also noticed is that that after a certain number of years practicing bhakti you now we start when i do these podcasts sometimes i we generally ask this question uh, what uh, brought what, how did you come to krishna consciousness but there's another question we rarely ask what keeps you in krishna consciousness <laughs> because you know there are so many reasons why a person may get frustrated disheartened and even lose faith we not lose faith in krishna but lose faith in other things to connect with krishna so one of the things which will keep us is if we have this engagement and then the higher taste that comes through engagement. So just maybe a couple of questions and then we will stop. I mean, we maybe I can have future podcasts also. Now, I do see to some extent at least a Brahminical engagement is being encouraged. You know, Burujan Pro started the VIHE and then MIHE has started and then Many other educational forums have started and devotees who want to study and devotees who want to teach, both are getting some forums by which they can develop that. And while at a basic level, everybody needs to have some knowledge of philosophy, but there are some who will, who will want that more, who will want that more and more. So then they they need to be facilitated. So from a devotee's perspective, so we talked from, I earlier talked from the leader's perspective, you said that leaders need to network better and then uh, responsibly hand over people to one, people whom they can't engage to somebody else. 
Now, from the individual's perspective, how does one decide whether actually this service is not compatible for me? Or is it just uh, because the mind is always restless and the mind will always find some reason to complain? So when is uh, when is one's dissatisfaction uh, due to incompatible engagement, or when is it just due to because of the fickle nature of the mind? So when should a so to summarize this? When should a devotee think that okay, now I have to I have to branch out and explore for myself some other service. I cannot continue continue this. Any thoughts on this? So that is when ashrama comes into picture. Uh, when the person is not fixed up in a proper ashrama, then his varna becomes very fickle. Uh, he thinks, he attributes all the difficulties what he's having to the work what he's doing. So ashrama has to be fixed up for that. And now you have brahmachari, the grasta, vanaprasta and sannyas. Suppose he's not very happy as a, in a family, uh, then uh, how can he do his work properly? So this is where we have to refine the ashrama dharma. When ashrama dharma is very nicely established, then the varanas uh, will automatically manifest uh, themselves and he can be, he'll automatically fit into that. See, uh, the fickle fickle nature of a person uh, is because of he not being happy somewhere else. Like sometimes you find in the roof, there is water pouring from here. But uh, the cause of the leak is somewhere else. It is not just here. Hmm? The same way, when you find a person is fickle, uh, you have to find out it is his, his nature, uh, his, his uh, position of being fickle or his nature of being fickle has a solution somewhere else. Uh, this is where we need to uh, talk to him more about and find out what is his uh, chart and all these things. And there should be an astrological advice taken. Certain things uh, we cannot see by our naked eyes. Certain things can only be seen through his chart. So astrology plays an important role in trying to find out what is he undergoing now. Depending on that, a person should give an advice. When the advice is given to him, uh, he acts on the advice, he rectifies himself. So, uh, uh, here it is, astrology plays important role. That is what I would like to say. Now, this is actually maybe astrology is something which we can discuss more separately. With respect yeah. to astrology, I have studied a little bit. I won't say that I'll study it in detail. What I find is that there are two extremes with respect to astrology also. One is that the skeptical attitude which rejects it completely as it doesn't, not that necessarily as devotees will say that it's superstitious. Uh, no, people who don't have any faith in Shastra, yeah. they may say it's superstitious. But devotees may say that, oh, today's astrologers are not good and it doesn't work and things like that. They may be skeptical. But the other extreme is that astrology can sometimes become like a replacement for one's intelligence. So astrology can become another excuse for not taking responsibility for one's life. Ultimately, we cannot, if, if, I, if, if I understand what you're saying rightly also, that you know, astrology is an important resource for us to take responsible decisions. We cannot, True. we cannot make the astrologer like another, another version of our Diksha Guru, that your word is the absolute authority and I'll follow it. So the astrology I'll also... Give example. I'll give yeah. a small example. For example, we are going to Yatra. Now I'm going to Badri Yatra. Uh, when we go to Badri Yatra or any Yatra, we see some uh, weather forecast and we see what is the weather. Get some guidance from the, you know, the, the uh, internet. And we prepare ourselves. So, uh, if we are able to get some information which we cannot directly perceive from our naked eye, and get some from source by which we can act accordingly, what is wrong in that? So, this is where astrology comes into picture. 
Hmm, that's like that I, yeah. So weather forecast. So is, for example, there are certain things which are happening. Yeah, which are which are beyond our control. For a particular period of time, this is going to happen. Hmm? This is going to happen. So he's he's okay. This is my karma. Uh, to understand all these things are according to my karma. So I should not be disturbed. Is it not what Bhagavad Gita tells us? Dukhe shonadvik mana, dukhe shvigatas priha, vita raga bhayak prodha, chita dirmiru chate. Hmm. Otherwise, when miseries, the miseries come, they attribute these miseries to somebody else. It is because of her I am suffering. It is because of him I am suffering. No. In the seventh hour, the Shani is dancing now. Uh, that's the reason. So, it's your karma. It makes a person, if not self realized bring him to an understanding that there is a higher controller who is actually uh, giving you these, these miseries or these happinesses, whatever it is. That is why uh, uh, if you don't have a good astrologer, rejecting astrology is not the solution. To find a proper person or to train a proper person or in the future devotees who have that karma of uh, taking up astrology, guiding people, uh, especially grasas in their family matters. Uh, that has to be a part of, it's a part of the society. It's part of our rashma. Part of our rashma. Daivagni is a part of uh, uh, every uh, every village uh, in, our, in, our, in our country. My, my grandfather would not uh, go to the field and sow a seed without uh, astrologer's uh, permission. Uh, it is not superstition. He would, it's a science. <laughs> that doesn't mean, okay, uh, he, has, he has told, that is why I, I don't have to do anything. It doesn't work like that. Uh, it is guidance. It is meteorological guidance for the weather. In the same way, the family weather is meteorological guidance requires the family weather condition also. <laughs> Beautiful. So, what has happened is, if I understand, uh, when you're speaking this, it struck me when you're talking about your chi your childhood or upgrowing experiences. Uh, maybe we could explore that also in the future a little bit more. But it seems that when the elements of traditional culture are taken in isolation, then they can be easily misunderstood and even misapplied. So, whether it is like we look at Varanashram and we take it in isolation and equate the caste system. We take up astro take astrology and take it in isolation. Oh, it is going to tell me about the future. So let me rely on it and neglect everything else. So it is more of a composite, composite culture, a composite way of living. And we need to, in one sense, interact with those who have lived it or those who are living it to understand how this is to be applied. Otherwise, we will yes, yes. We think we are applying it, but we'll end up some mislive misapplying it. Mm. Yes, yes. Thank you. So uh, I'll one last question, and then maybe we can conclude. Unless you, do you have some more points to speak about what whatever we have discussed? If something is no, nothing, nothing. not addressed, okay. So uh, with respect to we have we I talk from the temple's per, leader's perspective and the individual's perspective. And so with respect to the individual's perspective, your, your, uh, the, your point you are making is ultimately that we have to grow, if I, if I understood rightly, that we have, to, we have to grow spiritually. And that means eventually we have to give up our vasanas and that, that, uh, that kama krodh, lo mohamats, that has to be given up. So we can't live forever with a fickle mind. But at the same time, for us to stabilize our mind also, there has to be a pathway. And so we have to carefully introspect from our perspective, what exactly is the cause of my restlessness? So there also to some extent, you know, Prabhupada in the Nectar of Introduction, Nectar of Instruction Introduction says that once you come to, once we come to the mode of goodness, then how to advance further will be revealed. So to some extent, even the sadhaka, if they are in, they come to the mode of goodness, then they will also be able to better understand what what my nature is and what is just fickling change, fickle change, or uh, uh, fleeting changes of the mind. So, any any point pointers about 
about this about how the sadhakas can maybe come to sattva or better recognize their nature and then the sadhaka is a very big word okay sadhaka is a very big word not a, not easy to become a sadhaka uh, if you are a totally 100% sadhaka you don't require varnashrama at all you don't require okay now the question is <laughs> the question is how many in the moment are 100% 24 hours engaged in pure devotional service are doing sadhana 24 hours a day okay so you are using the word sadhana sadhana sadhaka for one who is full time sadhaka ah to full time is 24 hours engaged in sadhana bhakti but somebody who is 24 hours engaged in sadhana bhakti he doesn't require varnashrama he just practices for the sake of practicing it if it is there if it is not there also fine are we just this is this moment only meant for those who are sadhakas that is the question Hmm. That's this moment is meant for everybody in this in, in this world. Can you expect the moment you just connect somebody to Krishna consciousness immediately tomorrow onwards he becomes a sadhaka? He may take up some practices of sadhana bhakti, but hmm. his consciousness is still in karma mishra, jnana mishra, isn't it? Uh, so <laughs> you just cannot say that uh, if somebody is a sadhaka is. Uh, Kleshagni, uh, Shubhada, these two things should manifest. <laughs> uh, and our, we are not just talking, we are talking about it. There are some life members, there are visitors, the congregation, and congregation, one you may be one may be initiated, wife may not be initiated. There are children who are interested in Krishna consciousness, but they have their own goals in their life. Uh, so you are dealing with a, a, a larger spectrum of society. So, you may be a sadhaka, but you are dealing with whom? Mm. Uh, there's a huge variety of audience at different levels of consciousness with varied kind of desires. So, you have to accommodate them. Sri Prabhupada named it International Society. The society, you'll have all kinds of people coming. And you have to tax your mind to engage everyone. And gradually think of Ultimately, taking a pure devotional service, becoming sadhakas, and ultimately get a, achieve prema. Uh, yeah. So this is what is our uh, moment meant for. Uh, it's a challenge. It is, it is easy to just have a small matha and uh, eight, ten people are there in your mat and they can sleep in some corner. Just do, you don't have to take 100, 100 attendance for their mangalarti. You have eaten sadhu, and somebody gives some rice and dal, you cook and offer to the deities and eat. Where well, somebody gives donation, don't give donation. Somebody comes, doesn't come, it doesn't matter. If you're in that mood, then okay, fine. <laughs> but you may, Iskan is not made, Prabhupada did not make Iskan like that. Uh, mm. so it's, a, it's a bigger challenge. Bigger challenge. So again, in answers, we are to some extent in uncharted territory and we can't have pat answers for this. This yeah. has to be carefully, maybe according to Desha Kala Patra, who is yeah. where, we have to consider yeah. that and then decide that. Yeah. Hmm. You are having temple. You are dealing with politicians. You are dealing with uh, businessmen. You are dealing with enemies or envious. Uh, all, all kinds of people are there. Hmm. That makes it more complex. Agreed. Mm, so, I think this acknowledgement of complexity is in one sense a sign of humility. Yeah. Because, because sometimes we just, in the name of being faithful and strict, we, we try to advance very, very simplistic answers to complex issues. And then anybody who doesn't accept the simplistic answers, we say that they're not some or we say that you are not faithful. Just have faith. So yeah. the world is a complex place, and we have to, to consider it. It's not that we have immediate solution. And Prabhupada, I read a letter recently. Prabhupada wrote to Simti Moraji. I mean, I mean, I'm experimenting in various ways. 
how to attract these western people to krishna yes so so prabhupad's purpose of getting people to krishna was fixed but we could say the process the means by which he was doing oh. it there was experimentation with respect to that also so if he could have to do it we also will have to you know? yeah <laughs> yes bro so generally towards the end of the podcast i try to summarize we discuss a lot of things i'm not sure how much i can summarize but i'll try to do that in a few minutes and then if you there are some things which you would add, like to add as concluding words we can do that okay so broadly we discussed today about the needs uh, addressing the evolving needs of a devotee community uh, through varanashram that was the overall thrust so you started your spiritual you talked about your spiritual journey starting with that concept of destiny have happiness is fixed this distress fixed happiness will also be fixed and then how you came to uh, after being taking a lot of services in kolkata then you came to mira road and then that's where your services emerged afterwards and then we started discussing about the transition in our movement so how we have become a prominently congregation based movement now and is sort of sim- uh, sim- simply thinking of this terms of say just geographical location relocation of devotees from inside the temple to outside it's it can also be seen as a natural development of where we are moving towards varnashram so the four stages sankirtan initiation temple construction and uh, varnashram so varnashram so these four can be parallelly happening but if we focus on varnashram all the remaining will also happen because devotees will be engaged according to their uh, nature and you made a powerful point that projects don't run based on based on big projects don't happen simply based on a large number of devotees they happen based on enthusiastic devotees acting according to their swabhava mm, so that were, and then but if you do the so the first is like a the varnashram is like the uh, 100 rupee note in which all other notes are included and so now varnashram doesn't simply mean doesn't mean going to a village and retire living like that it means basically compatible engagement providing everyone uh, save seva according uh, service according to what they what is according what is the basically their nature and if this doesn't happen then devotees will be dissatisfied and that we could say that dissatisfaction from incompatibility with their nature will overshadow whatever spiritual taste they might get and that may cause them to go away from bhakti so now to how do we know what is a person's nature to engage them so at the basic level we can say find people's interests and engage them but over a period of time we can observe the birth and then we can observe the birth chart and astrology could be a tool maybe that will happen so we will, we will uh, the more more devotees become stabilized in ashram then over generations the varanas also also become clearer and then we discussed uh, in the present situation what can leaders do that if we can't if somebody ha- has a particular nature that we can't engage instead of making them feel guilty or rejecting them uh, or making them that say that you have to gi- you have to surrender and surrender doesn't mean giving up your nature but we can have a network of leaders and somebody else can be uh, who can engage such a devotee that can be respect carefully handed over just like a father hands over a daughter to another family in marriage so and and similarly for devotees who feel the need for space now that that seeking space should not be done in the mood of rebellion because ultimately rebellion is not going to help us advance spiritually but through careful introspection gradually we can find a niche find a way in which we can engage ourselves in some ways in the field of education as a example we discussed how already compatible service and compat that forums are happening but this understanding once varana it is and uh, moving our m- movement can say towards providing compatible engagement this is uh, this will require thought and acknowledging its complexity is also important sign of humility you made intermediately very striking point that the varanashram is not so much to be seen as a hierarchy as more of contempl- cont- uh, con- compatibility so varana when it is confused with jati 
it becomes a big problem and jati is by birth we are not proposing proposing jati vad at all propagating jati vad at all so even when there was a hierarchy in society in the past there was a lot of respect for everyone and uh, that every if like that was striking driver saab what you mentioned so everybody is respected and that is a part of we could say culture also Yes, people may have different services, but every service is valuable. Every no nature is itself lower. And then, just as this caste, our nation can be misunderstood. Caste system similarly, astrology may also be misunderstood. Like somebody may make either reject astrology as skeptically or make that the sole basis of decision making. But it is more like a weather forecast, which will help us to drive more carefully and effectively. So in this way, we can all. Uh, we as individuals and as uh, individual devotees and as leaders can move towards uh, providing everyone more harmonious engagements thank you very much for you want to add anything towards oh you yeah, perfectly summarized everything hari well thank you you know it was such a illuminating discussion i look forward to having you for many more podcasts in future prabhu thank you prabhu